my talk today is called Rust Out Your Sea, but it's going to be a little more general than Rust and C. Uh, we're going to be talking about general legacy code advice, dealing with legacy code in any language. We're going to talk about why you might want to rewrite some old code you have, or not. We're going to go over some techniques for incrementally rewriting a library, and why an incremental approach is good. We'll take a look at what I ended up with when I rewrote a library, and since I'm the first talk of the day, I'm going to take the opportunity to be a little inspirational and share a meta story about this talk and that I hope will encourage you to share what you know. So if you're thinking about rewriting code, your default position should be not to. A rewrite is not something to undertake lightly, especially if the, the code you're, you want to rewrite is doing what it needs to do just fine. Please don't leave this talk thinking, oh, Rust is the new hotness. I should tell my boss we have to stop working on everything to go off for a few months and rewrite everything in Rust. It's not what I'm trying to get across. Also, if you're the only person on your team interested in learning Rust or any new language you might be rewriting into, it may get you some job security, but that's not the good kind of job security. Uh, it's not very responsible. If you have some legacy code and you need to change it, and change is hard, or it's slow, or it crashes a lot, or no one understands it anymore, then maybe a rewrite would be a good idea. I would also posit that more people are able to write production Rust than production C, for re some reasons we'll see later. So if your team is willing to learn Rust or a newer tool, it might actually expand the number of maintainers. And then there's how I'm getting away with this. If you're doing a rewrite of something for fun, that's totally fine too. Basically, keep the users of your software in mind when you're doing a rewrite. What will the benefits be for them? Another caveat, and a reason this isn't a pure Rust talk, is that Rust isn't magic. Uh, some of the improvements I saw with the rewrite would have happened if I had chosen a different language to rewrite this library in, because rewriting gives you the benefit of hindsight. A confessional caveat. When I first started working on this talk, these were the relevant things I knew. These are the things I didn't know. I haven't written C since college, and I'm pretty terrified by C, actually. Uh, I knew there was a foreign function interface between C and Rust, but I hadn't tried it out. And the library I chose, I wasn't all familiar with how it worked. But I learned, and I did everything I'm going to show you, which means you can too. Which brings us to some background information. Zoffly, the library I chose to rewrite, is a compression tool like gzip or zlib. It was written by people at Google, and from what I can tell, it's actually pretty good C code. I didn't have any trouble building it, which is the first sign it was pretty good. There weren't any dependencies to set up, and it's only about 5,000 lines of C. The reason you might want to use Zopfly is that it makes smaller compressed files than gzip or zlib, but it still follows the deflate protocol, which is what browsers know how to expand. So using Zopfly on your CSS or JavaScript once can save bandwidth every time those files are transferred. You might not want to use Zoffly because it takes longer, compared to gzip, which makes the trade-off of taking less time to compress, but potentially producing files that aren't as small as they could be. Zoffly makes the other trade-off, with the use case being that you can take the extra time to compress your files once, and then save the extra file size every time your files are transferred. I found out about Zoffly in the context of Rails asset pipeline. Gzipping was actually disabled for a while as part of the asset, asset comp compilation process, and in the discussion around re-enabling it, Zoffly was considered as an alternative. If the file size of all the Rails assets in all the world was smaller, that would be a lot of bandwidth. So, but is it too slow? Would Rails developers complain? Could it be faster? And is the Zoffly Ruby gem a reasonable dependency to ask people to install? Would it work with JRuby? So now the trade-offs are looking less like a seesaw and more like comparing shapes in multiple dimensions. I thought Rust might be a good fit here, since it is fast, and maybe there was a chance to make it faster than C. And its cross-compilation story is good. I, I still have no idea if it works better with JRuby or what if what I ended up with in Rust is better than the C implementation, but I figured this was a good opportunity to try and learn. So to get into the techniques to use when rewriting code, the first thing you want to be sure of when you're doing a rewrite is that you aren't introducing new bugs. 
but legacy code often doesn't come with tests, and Zoffily didn't either. So the first thing I did was to make some golden master tests. In the case of Zoffily, this meant that I got a bunch of files, compressed them, saved the results, and with every change to the code, I could compress those same files and make sure I got the exact same compressed files. It's not as fine-grained as unit tests, so it can be hard to figure out what exactly broke if you don't get the same files, but it was better than not having any tests. Something I could have done, but I didn't, was to make sure that uh, the files I picked covered as much of the code as possible. Once you've got the golden master tests, you could start changing things. And what I recommend is to change the smallest possible thing you can at every step. And at this point, I'm going to quickly go through a series of small steps of moving a function from C to Rust. I don't expect you to remember all the transformations. I just wanted to show the mechanics and the scope of the minimal set of changes that you need to do to move a function from C to Rust. Okay, so here's a function from Zoffly called calculate tree size. And we want to copy this, move this whole function to C, to, from C to Rust. So we're going to copy the whole function. We're going to remove most of it and leave just the signature. And we'll put an X turn in the front and a semicolon at the end. This will let the, the C code call this function. Then we paste what we copied into the Rust code file. We have to tell Rust not to mangle the function name so that the C code can link to the symbol. Rust also isn't going to be happy about the non-snake case name, but we're going to leave it the way it is for now. So we're turning off the warning about the naming convention. We'll need a pub extern function at the beginning of the signature so that the C can call into the Rust. And we'll move the return type that was at the beginning to the end after an arrow. And at this point, you could start trying to like, compile it and just let the compiler tell you what needs to be fixed. And what the compiler would say at this point is that the argument names go before the types in Rust, so we'll switch them around. We need to change the types a bit. There's a Rust library called libc that defines aliases to map the C types to the Rust types but we have to change the unsigned to be c underscore u int instead. Next, we change the variable declarations to use let, and because variables are immutable by default in Rust, we mark the variables that need to be mutable by the mute keyword. We change the for loop to be the Rust way of doing for loops with the range. We take out the parentheses from the if condition and add braces around the body of the if. And in Rust, we don't need to return if we're return explicitly if we're just returning the last expression. We just have to remove the semicolon from the end. And at this point, the golden master test should pass again. And that's the least amount possible you can do to change the C into Rust. And then you repeat. Doing this incrementally, function by function, struct by struct, is important. Not only do you only have to learn a little bit of the library at the time, it's kind of like a red-green refactor TDD cycle, except it's more like moving a function to Rust, getting it to compile, getting the test to pass, and then committing. Taking lots of baby steps and committing after each step is great, because when someone asks that ever-present question during rewrites, as long as you only commit and push the code in a state where it's compiling and passing tests, you'll be in this sort of superposition of done and not done. You're, you're done because you could ship what you have right at that point and switch to something else, and you won't have unrealized benefits from the sunk cost. But you're not done because the whole library isn't rewritten. So it gives you some flexibility in how you prioritize the rewrite if more important things come up. And maybe you never finish. Maybe you just do the most important bits and leave the rest as, as they are. The other benefit of committing often after small changes is that since you don't have fine-grained unit tests to tell you where the problem is, if your tests fail and you don't know why, it's not that big a deal to go back to a state where everything was working and try again, and probably try again with a smaller step. Most of the time when I broke something, I, I was being overconfident and changing too much at once. In this context, by smaller step, I mean things like extracting functions from larger functions so that you can move the smaller pieces from C to Rust or perhaps making the C more like Rust first so that the change is more mechanical. And even if it looks straightforward to make the code more idiomatic in your target language while you're moving it, resist refactoring until after you have the test passing. If we insert that step into our cycle, 
it looks more like this, with a refactoring step to make the code more idiomatic after the test of passing. Then, once we have all the places that call a function moved over to Rust as well, we can really start to make some improvements. Uh, one way to decide what to change in order to get those pieces more into Rust more quickly to be able to refactor them is to take a look at the call graph of what functions call what other functions. This is Zopoli's full call graph, and from this zoomed out view, you can see a few interesting things. You can see there's like a main function on the left that most of the work comes from. There's some interdependencies between some of the functions in the middle. And you can start to see seams, places where we might be able to carve off an independent chunk. For instance, this part looks pretty isolated. If we zoom in on that, we see this one function that calls the others, and they all call Zopli max cached sublin. These all have to do with uh, caching the longest match, and there's a cached data structure associated with this. If we move all these data structures and functions over to Rust, then this one entry point from C can stay the same, but we can refactor and change the inner parts to be more idiomatically Rust without the C code being affected. This can get you more of the memory safety that Rust gives you sooner than randomly choosing functions to rewrite. If your goal with a rewrite is to improve performance, then you might want to profile the code and work on the slowest parts first. I didn't go about it this way, but if I had, I would have taken a look at the blame graph of the C performance and probably looked into the Zopli update hash method first. It's one of the large bars on the right because that's taking the most time. So, did I see any benefits from the rewrite in Rust? Subjectively, I think the Rust code is clearer and safer. And let me show you what I mean. First, the improvements in clarity. This is the function that I demonstrated moving to Rust earlier with some of the details left out so I could make the font bigger. Uh, what is this function actually doing? It initializes a mutable result variable to zero, then it iterates, doing a calculation eight times and keeping track of the minimum result and returning that. This takes me a while to read and understand. Rust, even though it is able to provide low-level control, has ideas from higher-level languages like iterators, and we can use those here. This is what the same function looks like using iterators instead. This is less code to read through. We've gotten rid of the mutable state in the result variable. It has the call to min in there, so I think this is clearer what the purpose of this code is. And the unwrap or at the end lets us set a default value if there's nothing in the results and we want to return zero. I think this is an improvement. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the defining features of Rust is that it eliminates certain classes of bugs that are prevalent in C. For example, this is a bug from Zopli's C code base. There's a real possibility of this function, Zopli gzip compress, getting a null pointer for the in parameter, which causes it to crash because the code in this function didn't check to make sure the pointer's null. And this kind of error can happen all throughout C code all the time. That's just how pointers work in C. You have to be careful. Another thing about working with pointers in C is that you have to pass around the length of the data that comes after the pointer as well and keep those together. In Rust, there's this data type called a slice, and that represents the concept of a pointer plus a length, and Rust keeps those together for you. And Rust guarantees that the pointer in the slice won't be null. The slice might be empty and have length zero, but attempting to read from it won't crash. This is what makes me confident about programming in Rust and rather than programming in C. And lastly, performance. Is Rust as fast as C? It's what everyone wants to know. Really what we're gonna see here today is, is the Rust that I translated as fast as pretty good C. I haven't gotten it exactly back down to C speeds yet. It's pretty close. This is a performance graph at each commit of mine. It's a little bit noisy because I only ran the tests once per commit. Uh, the C code took about one second on my golden master tests. The big spikes in here were points during the rewrite where I was copying lots of data around when I shouldn't have been. Uh, some of that was unavoidable while I was doing certain transitions. At this point in the graph was where I had all the code in Rust. 
And the performance stayed around one and a half seconds until recently when I profiled and got this last drop here. I found an inefficient way I had implemented something in the Rust code, and I was able to fix that and get it down to 1.2 seconds, so I'm pretty close. Let's talk about this jump. I didn't notice this jump in performance at the beginning. I wasn't paying very, very close attention to how long it was taking to run our tests, and it wasn't a huge jump, but at the end when I did this graph and, and noticed it, uh, I looked into it, and it turns out I had introduced a bug. I thought I was storing values to a cache to save for later. It turns out I was only caching them to local variables, which didn't really help. Uh, and this demonstrates that golden master tests can't catch everything. So do what I say and not what I did. If your goal is to maintain or improve performance, your iterations should probably look more like this. After each function gets moved over, spend time checking performance and catching those regressions earlier instead of at the end like I did. So, based on my results, should you embark on a rewrite? Maybe. And at this point, I'd like to tell a meta story about this talk. I first did this talk about a year ago at Pittsburgh Tech Fest, and I did it again at a functional programming meetup. I posted the slides and the code and some notes, no video though, um, posted them to Reddit and Twitter, kind of forgot about it. Uh, then last October, I was reading a blog post that someone linked to in the Rust subreddit about GNOME. Not this kind of GNOME. The GNOME desktop environment for Linux. It's been around since 1999. The blog post was by Federico Mena, one of the people who started the GNOME project, and he was writing about porting a little piece of GNOME from C to Rust. I was reading this blog post, as one does, and then I did a double take on this purple link here which I had visited. Uh, let me just zoom in a bit, hover over the link, zoom a bit more, enhance. <laughs> he, he was linking to my talk. And he was saying really nice things. Um, my presentation helped convince him that what he wanted to do was possible. And this process has been going well. Recently, some of the Rust team went uh, to a GNOME hackathon in Mexico to collaborate on this effort to rewrite parts of GNOME in Rust. So I encourage you to share what you know. You never know what the effect might be. It might just be in the right place at the right time for someone out there. What I hope you take away from my less than convincing results is that it's possible to rewrite C libraries in Rust in an incremental manner. If you choose to undertake a rewrite, you should have good reasons for doing so, and you should measure against those goals along the way. I also hope that you go out and share what you know to help what others in the future. And now for a little bit of shameless self-promotion. I am the co-author on the Rust Programming Language book, which is due out this fall from No Starch Press. If I've piqued your interest in Rust, I run the Rust Belt Rust Conference, which will be in Columbus this fall. You can get on our mailing list at our website to hear when tickets go on sale. And my husband Jake and I started a company to do Rust consulting. If you'd like to pay people to do a rewrite in Rust like I did in this talk, or write a prototype in Rust, or do Rust training, let us know. And I have references and links to all sorts of things at this short link. Thank you very much. <laughs>